Well, it's great to be here. A uh, round of applause for the organizers. Really fantastic. Really great. It makes, makes me truly proud to be an alumni. Uh, when I was last on a stage uh, here at Connecticut College, I was pre preparing for my career in the theater. And if anybody had told me that at that time that uh, I would be back here some 30 plus years later talking about film related topics, I would have laughed them off the stage. Um, I was rather a theater snob and uh, fairly anti film. Uh, but I am going to talk about uh, film related activities today. And uh, based on my 20 years or so in the documentary and news business, uh, I'd like to talk really about the quality of our news and our information diet and how it's influencing our decision making and how I think it can be improved. Uh, I'm going to use today as a case study Afghanistan uh, in part because uh, comparatively we've had quite a bit of information from Afghanistan over the last 12 years uh, and also I've been working there since 2009 uh, as an educator and as a filmmaker. Uh, I'm interested in the information and its impact. Who's telling us the stories and why are they choosing those specific stories? What has their reporting taught us? What are we actually learning from it? And how has this inf information influenced the general public's opinions and what they want, in this particular case, us to be doing or not doing? It's very important because information does uh, actually uh, influence. In fact, uh, it is what decides what we do. And uh, it is what decides, particularly in a place like Afghanistan, what our government does. Uh, we can, through this information, either help people or actually harm them. What I'd like to do is do a comparative study here, quite briefly between mainstream media's coverage of Afghanistan and then show you some of Afghans' coverage uh, of their own situation. First here, we have an incredible photograph, and these images are from the New York Times, uh, and I think we would see them as fairly standard fare in terms of the kind of image we get in the heat of battle, uh, the bullets flying, the bombs dropping. Or another from last week, uh, titled, or the caption was, Afghan and U.S. soldiers uh, out on mission together as part of their training work in this vast landscape. And here, also very tragically from last week, another suicide bombing uh, that killed uh, Afghan civilians, U.S. soldiers, and uh, civilians working in the State Department and USAID. So, uh, these are the kind of images that we fairly regularly see coming out of Afghanistan. If I did a search on Frontline, one of our main uh, PBS news programs, and asked for what I could get about Afghanistan, as you can also see here, while uh, often fantastic programming and important programming, pretty much war-centric, either behind the scenes with the Taliban, behind the scenes with the U.S. military, inside our government departments, uh, what's going on uh, from that perspective. But now let's compare that to the Afghanistan that Afghans know and live in day in, day out. Uh, what are they dealing with? And if given the chance, what are the stories that they tell about the world around them? And how does it contrast to uh, really the understanding and information we have about Afghanistan? This, for example, is a story that an Afghan did on farming and water issues. I'm sure many of us know that Afghanistan is an agrarian society. 80% of the population are farmers, mostly subsistence farmers. Uh, but how many of us know that the number one crucial problem for Afghans is water? More Afghans are killed by water than by insurgents on an average year. And uh, they are constantly under the threat in many parts of the country of flash floods and of um, droughts. So here's a bit of a video clip from this story that the Afghans did. And we can see and understand the landscape that they're dealing with 
And we can also see that it's not a landscape that is full of soldiers, that it is a land of constant battle. Most of Afghanistan, of course, isn't. Uh, it is a land of 28 million people trying, in some cases desperately, uh, to get on with their lives. If we look in comparison at another Afghan story, uh, this is a story about a woman, a teacher. Uh, she is dealing with trying to do basic community organizing, organizing a girls' school uh, in her village, and she's going door to door uh, to try and get the families to be able to uh, accept the girls' school and to get as many uh, people involved with it. As we also probably know, illiteracy is extremely high in Afghanistan. We'll watch a little bit of it. So, illiteracy is very high in Afghanistan, but we probably know that. But how many of us know that actually some 87% of Afghans in a survey that was just completed uh, this last month believe that men and women should have equal access to education. I expect that's as surprising as it was to me as it might be to many of you, based on what our media often is reporting about, which presents Afghans more as school burners and acid throwers. Of course, those 87% want education to be provided within the extremely conservative and cultural constraints of their society, meaning girls can't mix with boys, girls should not be out in public on their own, but at the fundamental, they'd like equal education. There are so many incredible challenges, unbelievable challenges facing the Afghan government, uh, the Afghan society and individuals. Uh, we hear a lot about corruption, but is it ever put into the context of the, uh, in, for many, uh, insurmountable uh, things that they have to deal with, such as the fact that Afghanistan has, over the last 10 years, tried to reintegrate uh, some 6 million refugees from Pakistan and, and, and Iran. Uh, that's more than any country has ever attempted in the history of the world. Uh, an incredible and, quite frankly, any government outside would have a huge problem trying to do it. Or how about in terms of disabilities? Afghanistan has one of the highest percentage of people with disabilities of any country in the world. Uh, some one million, it's estimated, have disabilities. Here's a story that was done about a woman who's organizing other people with disabilities uh, around a business for uh, tailoring. و اصلا ما ایت فکر میکردم که ما روح انزند استم جسم موبی. وقتی که باز خونه بیرون برام دم، اکثریت دخترای جوان دیدم که دست پایشان قطع شبشان کور شد. و اونا هم بازم مبارزه دارن و so why such a stark difference between this visualization of Afghanistan and a visualization like this? Well, in the first place, we have to understand that when somebody like me is sent to a place like Afghanistan as a reporter, uh, if we're being called a war correspondent, uh, there's a lot of aura around that and we win prizes because we get as close to action as possible. When I was embedded with the, uh, with the unit in, the, in Bagram Air Base, and I was doing something around the Afghan activities, uh, the AP reporter who I was bumped with, his only mission was to get with the unit that had the most bullets flying, the most action, because that's what was going to get him awards. Uh, and that's what his editors want. The other issue is that our publishers and editors think that what we want 
is only that which relates to that that we know, meaning our people and our activities. So publishers and editors are pushing us as reporters to tell the stories that we can relate to. The LA Times reporter, when I was there, was doing a story on dogs, because we love dogs, right? And therefore, we can relate to that. American reporters in general, we have to understand, and the American news industry is telling the story of our news in Afghanistan, and not necessarily the news from Afghanistan, which is two different things and a distinction that's not always made very clear. My answer to these challenges was to go to Afghanistan in 2010 and to train Afghans to tell their own stories, to be able to be skilled in documentary filmmaking uh, in a culture where filmmaking has basically been banned for many years, uh, and get them to a place where they could tell their stories. Um, and so I worked with a team of Afghans, and uh, we produced these clips that you've been seeing, 10 films, uh, stories by Afghans about Afghan social and economic development issues. Uh, the training is very intense, five weeks, and required not that people had any background in filmmaking, but that they came with a storytelling background of some form and an interest in social and economic development issues. Let's do one more comparison here. Here's uh, a story from the New York Times on poppy and um, heroin production. And from our perspective, and importantly, we're looking at this story from, from the uh, question of how much is being funded by the, uh, how much of the insurgency is being funded by this crop, and how much of it is ending up back on our streets as heroin. The Afghan perspective is similarly important, however. How many of us actually know that Afghans have a huge addiction problem? Some two million Afghans are trying to deal with opium addiction, and it has many other uh, societal problems that it's causing, with almost no infrastructure or any kind of capacity to help people deal with it. Here's a short film that was made about a woman whose life is being uh, further challenged by a husband who's addicted. And we'll just watch a little bit of it. مواد که پیشگاری میزن خود از او بخیست خودم هم هم بخیه اونجا فاب کده بشن مثلا دیگه غم خورم نیه که بوب خاله بره یک مادر داشت که مادرش فاب کده اول میخوزم که دربار خدا شکرم نماز خدا میخوانم بعد از اون که My contention is that if we had been seeing more of stories like this from within the Afghan perspective, it's not an either or. We need the uh, battlefront perspective, we need the current affairs, but we also need this broader perspective and particularly the local perspective. And if we had it, I think that uh, now after 10 years, we'd be thinking differently about how to try and create sustainable solutions uh, for ourselves uh, and for Afghans rather than focusing, as we are now, uh, on a win-lose equation, on a pull-out or stay, 
or in what number of troops should stay. I've done a lot of uh, briefings, or the, we have done a lot of briefings uh, with these films uh, across the country, hundreds of screenings from town halls to congressional hall, halls and, and uh, departments. And there are a couple of things that people say to me that really hit it home about this matter. One is people often say, wow, this is the first time I'm hearing an Afghan speak for themselves or seeing an Afghan actually do anything. I didn't, you know, know uh, an Afghan in this sense before. And the second thing they tell me is, uh, in sometimes a rather accusatory manner, is why are you fabricating these films? Clearly these aren't the truth. This isn't what I see on the news. Where's the war in these films? Why is this so, such a narrow view of what must be the actuality of Afghanistan? And this tells me that our news uh, has a problem, that we need to transform what we're understanding about places like Afghanistan. So this work has grown organically, and it's uh, developed into an organization called Community Supported Film. And our mission is to now, uh, in Afghanistan and many other places, try and expand the local capacity in documentary filmmaking and video journalism to try and focus their energies on telling their own stories about social and economic development issues, and then to use those locally and internationally to expand people's perspectives and understandings. We all have to demand an improvement in our news diet, a, ba a balanced diet that's less self-centric, that includes more local perspectives, will really help us be better informed and therefore more effective citizens. Thank you very much.